Final readings from Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It's on page 161 in the New Testament. Listen again to the Word of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, most of you know that I'm a native Texan and how my first call in ministry was in Alabama. I spent around three years there, and I jokingly refer to that as my three-year exile. When I went, I stubbornly held on to all of my Texan identity. Um, before I, I, I bought a Rangers jersey, and I was left there kind of in the store picking out which one. I picked Teixeira because it was the closest to Texas. It was T-E-X, right? Um, there, uh, in Alabama at the time, they didn't require a front license plate. So I went through several uh, Texas Longhorn decorative plates, kind of like this one, that still uh, sits in my office today. Yeah. And I never actually got a driver's license there. Because I really didn't want to let go of my Texas one. I think I'm past the statute of violations on that one by now. And, you know, it's interesting, while Texas is definitely in the southern portion of the United States, I was repeatedly informed of how Texas was not the south, you know. And it grew to be a source of pride to respond, I know, Texas is Texas, right? <laughs> well, my prideful stubbornness reminded me of the short story by Craig Brian Larson, who described how on the, on the way to work, I noticed some interesting signs on the SUV in front of me. The spare tire mounted on the back had the words, Texas Longhorns. It had an orange steer head icon, you can tell he's not from Texas, uh, steer head icon and the word Texas, right? My kind of guy. Uh, the license plate frame was bordered with the words Longhorns on top and University of Texas at the bottom. But something didn't add up. The license plate frame was screwed into a Land of Lincoln license plate <laughs> with a picture of Old Abe on it. I live in Illinois and the SUV's license plate showed that this driver now did too. I assumed the owner of this SUV had moved but had not yet identified with his new home and had no plans of changing loyalties. Clearly, Craig hasn't met many Texans. <laughs> he continues, when we move, we often go through a slow transition of loyalties to our new home. And so it is as a Christian. When we come to Christ, the kingdom of God becomes our home, but the kingdom of this world does not easily leave our hearts. The great challenge of the Christian is to overcome divided loyalties and fully identify with God's kingdom. Now, I thought that was fitting as we wrap up this series on renewal. I thought the topic of renewal was a better topic to start off the new year rather than the stereotypical discussion on resolutions because when we talk about transforming life, that requires more than trying harder in this area of life or that area. We're concluding this series with renewing faith, because I think that perfectly builds on everything we've looked at so far. Now, too often, when we think of the word faith, we categorize it as a noun, right? It's this nice, warm and fuzzy feeling in our hearts or in our souls, or it's this impressive amount of information that we've stored away in our brains. And if anything, right, we need to think as faith as a verb. It's more than a feeling and thinking. Faith is about doing. 
Faith is about putting those feelings and that information into practice, right? I'm sure you've heard the phrase, you play like you practice. Erroneously, sometimes people say, practice makes perfect. But if you practice wrongly, you'll never achieve perfection. Therefore, a saying attributed to Vince Lombardi goes, practice does not make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, right? And, and you would know that if you watched or listened to him uh, coach or teach uh, about the Green Bay Sweep back then. One of the big challenges of the Christian faith, right, is running some of the plays Jesus calls. Unlike Kellen Moore, Jesus was completely unpredictable. I oh, know. Too, too soon. <clears throat> but these are things Jesus taught, right? To be first, you have to be last. To be rich, you have to become poor. To live, you have to die. Forgive your enemies. Love those who persecute you. Be a servant. All right? Definitely not the health and wealth prosperity gospel. Nor does this appear to correlate with what we think as the path to success and happiness in our culture today. But somehow, especially if you've put some of this into practice into faith these are the instructions for a renewed faith a renewed life present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god now someone made the point that the problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps slithering off the altar In other words, we know what Jesus tells us to do, right? Again, we have the playbook. He lived as the example for us. But we know how much easier it is to get, to get angry or want revenge on someone rather than living that faith of love and forgiveness. We know what it's like to struggle loving the enemy and welcoming the stranger. And so we slither off the altar through our sins. Another stumbling block some of us may encounter is the use of the word sacrifice. Because there's no sugarcoating what the animal sacrifice ritual was like in the temple. And so often we focus on the death of, say, the animal. It's a really good thing Paul specifies living sacrifice, right? Because just think how that could be misinterpreted or worse. But this is such a key point for what Paul is talking about. The Interpreter's Bible says the symbolism of sacrifice was the outward expression of complete self-devotion to God. The worshiper offered a portion of his life, a living creature, the fruit of his labors, fit for the support of his life as the expression of his own dedication to God. It was not in the death of the victim that the heart of the sacrificial rite was expressed. The central and decisive thing was the offering of the life to God. And the truest sacrifice that man can offer to God is that of living according to his will. This offering of our very selves, right? The sacrifice of my will be done for thy will be done is our act of worship. And Paul uses this, uses this interesting word for worship. Originally, it meant to, to work for hire or pay. So that's important. It wasn't the work of the slave. It was voluntary. But then it came to mean to serve. But then unpacking that a little bit more, it meant that to which a man gives his whole life. And in the Bible, it's never used as working or dedicating oneself for another human being, not even a king. It's used only in service to and worship of God. Yes, this hour of worship 
is important, but the other 167 hours of the week are to be dedicated to God as well. Then Paul takes us into this incredible challenge in verse 2, right? Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. When Paul writes about conforming, he uses a verb that means the outward form that varies year to year, day to day. Think maybe of any embarrassing fashion trend you might have been a part of in the past that you would never wear today. And then when Paul talks about being transformed, this is the essential unchanging shape or element of anything, right? So to do this word of severe injustice, we're going to simplify it just to mean that it's our inside as opposed to the conforming outside, right? It's our core. My outward appearance will change today when we leave here and go to the rodeo. I'm going to leave my robe here at church. That would look kind of weird there. And I'm totally conforming a city cowboy with my boots, pearl snaps, my belt buckle, which I never wear. I've got it all on because I'm conforming my outward appearance to my environment today. But my inward person will remain the same. So to live this kind of worshipful life, we have to be renewed from the inside. And this, the verb that he uses is where we get metamorphosis. It's the same verb used for transfigure in Matthew's gospel. John Ortberg said, if we cannot be transformed, we will settle for being informed or conformed. If we cannot be transformed, we'll settle for being informed or conformed. We need this renewal of our minds, of our faith, so we can live this kind of sacrificial, worshipful life each and every day. And that's living out our faith, the giving away of ourselves to the way of Christ. And our practice gets a little more perfect each day. And maybe it's kind of like learning to ride a bike. Something clicks. And by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us, renewing our minds, all of a sudden, we're doing it. We slither off the altar less and less to where we become living sacrifices for God's glory. Now, it's been a while, but a while back I shared Ted Lasso's coaching on being a goldfish. He tells one of his players, you know what the happiest animal on earth is? It's a goldfish. You know why? It's got a 10 second memory. Be a goldfish. In other words, when we slither off, when we mess up, right? Own up to it, confess it, repent it, then leave it and move forward. I love that. We have to let that go and learn and keep going. But I want to leave with you one other surprising animal example today. It was one of the great basic beliefs of the Stoics that there was a spark of God in every living creature. Skeptics laughed at this doctrine. God in worms, demanded the skeptic. God in dung beetles, whereat the Stoic replied, why not? Cannot an earthworm serve God? Do you suppose that it is only a general who is a good soldier? Cannot the lowest private or camp attendant fight his best and give his life for the cause? Happy are you if you are serving God and carrying out the great purpose as truly as an earthworm. Be an earth. Dedicate each hour, each action, renewed by fresh determination, living the faith, so that the world looks at you and knows you to be a Christ follower, the great source of our renewal. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit.